When considering the spaces of mysticism and occultism, there are a few chief ideas and ideals, one of which is called Hermeticism. It's this odd conglomerate of this Greco-Egyptian philosophy. Many of us have become very well acquainted with the idea of it, but rarely do we step into its bounds, into the corpus or divine pymander. In fact, nowadays it is more often perverted and used as a means of expressing some sort of personalized ideals that are otherwise disconnected from that particular philosophy. Hermeticism is itself observational in nature. By observational, what I mean is an observational philosophy, which roots itself in the idea of looking at the universe from a direct perspective. You view something as it is, and you make a deduction based on what is going on. A perfect example is to say something as such as a plant needs earth to survive. The seed, which is the generative aspect of the plant, is put into the ground and then is added to water and the earth in which it is subsisting and will then sprout and create new life. In a very old school way, we might say these are elemental forces of this idea of earth and water generating the existence of this plant. And then we might elevate it. We might spread it out into different ideas and ideals. We might say that the human being is much like a plant. That there are seeds, and that there is earth, and there's tillage, and there's growth, and then the human being will spring forth into the world. The philosophy is really not dictated by exactly what was observed, rather by the, we might say, underlying metaphor that exists in the process that we witness. Observational philosophy has a very long history of this type of engagement, this idea of production and growth. And it may also exist in how we view things like elemental forces. In the antiquated mind, the elemental forces were really more assured. We might say things like fire, earth, wind, and water were natural to them. But in another manner, we have a similitude of style. Where we had earth, we now have gravity. Where we had fire, we now have thermal energy and its particular expectations. Where we had air, we have spatial awareness and physics. And where we had water, we have the realization of what it is that keeps the body going. The ideas of blood and life generation and the flow of things, be it related to time, change, or simply degradation, which is intrinsic to those two things. Hermeticism evolved quite abruptly over the years, coming in and out of existence showing and rearing its head in the, you might say, Age of Enlightenment, you know, displaying itself in the antiquated minds as its original philosophy. Of course, original is kind of an artificial usage. It's more of a descriptor, more of an idea. But it would go many, many hundreds of years into the modern era. And Hermeticism was shifted. And by that, what I mean to say is that its metaphysics was developed and transmogrified into this <laughs> very strange idea of using observational philosophy to create an entire system of creation, which I detailed in the particular video that I called The Origin of Magic. Even though it is not particularly hermetic and more human, it still applies to the hermetic ideas. Which brings us into the modern era. Out of all this consideration and all this observational philosophy and this developmental force and ideas, Eventually, a few Freemasons would get together and decide that there was a greater scope for them. And they would come and they would create their own organization and their own body, which they would name the HOGD, or the Hermetic Order, which I will not complete because strangely enough that name has gathered a little bit of poor traction due to other bodies attempting to assume the same. Not that they are in any way spiritually or mentally related, but they are attempting to do so. When I think about these groups, we must understand that the idea of a magical society has existed throughout the ages. That it serves a purpose in the human mentality to have a construct by which they can express themselves both spiritually and esoterically. It has a very grand purpose in the schema of human religion. And then one day, with the development of this particular body, we would see magical society prosper. 
they would gather together. They would group up and they would go through initiatic ritual, thereby to, we would say, implement or impress some great idea of occult philosophy within the individual who is going through the initiation. And that occult philosophy was rooted in hermetics. It was rooted in hermeticism and understanding what was so valuable about the antiquated world. Because in the simplicity of the human being, do we find the power of the human being? Many of us may disagree with that. We may think that's artificial or ridiculous, but it is not. We find time and time again that the core of our problems, the root of all of our issues, and the answer to those issues are at the base of human expression. They do not exist in the high levels of intellect. Rather, our understanding of them does, but their true solution is at the core of our being. And we must see now that to some extent, the expression of magical philosophy is an attempt to address that disconnect. It's an attempt to elevate the individual. And the nature of that elevation depends on the group by which it is existing within. Coming back to the HOGD, we see now Yeats, a great philosopher and a great idealist, was connected to the assumption that theology be it through mysticism, and most majorly through, we might say, myth, was capable of expressing some sort of idealism between these antiquated divinities and the world by which we understand it. This very, we might say, grandeur conception of self-experience was broken down into ritualistic practice. The ritual in question is not any particular ritual of the HOGD. Rather, it's the idea and conception that in the experience of a ritualistic initiation and practice that we are outrightly developed, that we experience change at an abrupt level. And I don't just mean that physically and mentally, but in reference to the Masonic understanding, we might say that there is a spiritual change, that the soul of the individual has actually been altered, which falls more into the alchemical state. It would be unfair for me to describe the level of similarity that hermeticism, and we might even say affiliation, that hermeticism and alchemy have with each other. It is not that they are entirely disconnected. As many will understand, observational philosophy is the basis of the alchemical art. If you get out of the metallurgical ideas and the basis of it being so intrinsic to worldly knowledge that has then become esoteric by people simply not knowing about it, we will understand that the alchemical practice, particularly on the mystical and spiritual level, serves to be a hermetic elevation. Hence why we see such individuals as Mary Ann Atwood describing the hermetic art through the alchemical process. It is because they are both one and the same. Of course, I will not address that here. I come back to the HOGD. When we witness the ideas of spirituality expanding themselves so immensely, so abruptly, we must witness and become witness to our own nature. The entire idea of observational philosophy is not just in looking at the external, however, it is self-analysis. It stands to reason that with the macrocosmic microcosmic conception that is so popular to generalized occultism, that there is a world in which we must essentially assume our own self-divinity. I do not mean to say that we are as gods. What I mean to say is that our conception and understanding of deity is often put through the human lens, and the greatest expression by which we can know it is through that same lens. We need no look further than the Torah, or the book of Genesis, Bereshit, in which it says, Hark, he has become like us. It is a quoting from Elohim in early Genesis after eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Of course, I do not mean to get biblical for the sake of an argument, because I feel like that is an artificial look at things, but in its basic theological nature, we must know that for many a year, long before we understood the conception of biblical knowledge, the human being deified itself on a great altar, understanding that it was intrinsically different. It may have not known consciousness outrightly or defined it. However, it was distinctly separated from the animalistic beings which it ruled over and it knew that it did so. It did not seek to control them. However, in the expression of artistic representation, it would seek control over itself, which was the greatest achievement. 
To be able to dictate the nature of the animal within oneself became a power beyond all reason. It became the destruction of ego. It became the dominion over the animalistic inclination. It was, essentially, a ruiner of all evils. And it championed over all imbalances. When we see magic, not necessarily just as a philosophy or a practice, but as a self-indulgent understanding of our own nature, we are released into a new world, one that demands a particular mental elevation. And this elevation is essentially Hermeticism. As always, my name is River. Thank you for joining me here at the Nematon. A massive thank you to my friends, patrons, and supporters. I appreciate you more than you know.